Okay. Good afternoon. So Andre and I, Andre is an expert on all things Azure and Cloud. Um, and I am a person who talks a lot. So between the two of us, we're going to do a joint session. <laughs> so we're going to go through a high level overview of the cloud. I'm sure this stuff is stuff you will know. I'm more than happy to take questions as we go through, by the way. Um, we're going to talk about how you could get your NAS system, regardless of what the system it is, to the cloud. Talk a little bit about how the cloud uh, as your helps with security considerations and tell you how we can help you with that should you want our help. So it's probably easy enough on the basis that a cloud is simply a collection of servers somewhere in some data center. Most people talk about these four as being the main business oriented clouds. I'm not including like the Apple cloud and that sort of thing. No, but you can't put your systems in there. Uh, so Azure, AWS, the Amazon Web Services, uh, Google's cloud platform and IBM, and even then I'd probably put Google to one side, it's really Azure, AWS and IBM. Um, we've used uh, both AWS and Azure, we used AWS before Azure came out, so we were quite early into that cloud uh, world, but when Azure came out we moved to it, and I think you would say far better. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So, we're only going to concentrate on Azure because we don't really care about the other ones. Um, what benefits do you mainly get out of uh, an Azure uh, or a cloud system? Uh, cost effectiveness and uh, scaling in and out is, is the main thing. You know, the fact you can just wind up a server, use a server, turn the server off. Uh, you know, it's a funny thing you don't think about. If you buy a server, you, like, you pay the money, you buy the server, and it's there forever. Um, uh, we've, because you pay for the time you use servers, we're even doing things like automatically shutting systems down at 6 o'clock at night and winding them back up at 7 o'clock in the morning. Well, that saves you half a day of, <laughs> of paying for service. So we're doing that a lot. Um, so you can really get uh, cost effectiveness out. Um, obviously, you, you transfer your capital spend into monthly spend. And I think if you did the is it cheaper argument, very difficult one to argue. Depends. Depends, what, depends how many mistakes you made buying expensive servers that turned out to be the wrong ones. You know, you don't make mistakes with this because you wind it up. If you decide it was too big or too small, you simply adjust it. Um, obviously, you get flexible access any, from uh, any location. Um, and there's just so many tools that you get with it to help create uh, an environment which is easy to manage. So if, if you're managing your own as your platform, uh, there's so many tools that you get and Andre uses on a daily basis to manage that platform. The automatic scaling, uh, scale, uh, uh, switching on servers, failover and so on, and the high availability uh, that Azure will give you 99.95. How much is that in a month it, it could be down, Andre? So almost an hour. So you'll be surprised <laughs> that even though the number is quite high, you get like 48 minutes if you do the you don't get the downtime, but that's what the <laughs> but it represents. So we, we just hope it's between two and two and three in the morning. That's what we um, we'll come to that later. Um, so uh, let's assume you've all got now systems. So can we just what who's got a, a, a like 2017, 2016, 2015, 2013 old classic? What are you answer? Nothing yet. Nothing yet. <laughs> okay. What are you doing at this conference? <laughs> <laughs> so, if you had a nav system, that's all we're going to talk about. How do you get your nav system in the cloud? Um, so, there's a couple of things that we need to consider. There's a different database style. You, c you could treat servers in the cloud just like your own servers. You implement a server, and on it, you put a SQL server, and that's the server you use. We'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But one of the benefits of the cloud are options you get around this. So we need to look at which database is the right one. Do you need high availability? It's really funny that if you had to buy servers, not that many of our customers, certainly in the SME sort of space, small, medium uh, companies, in the past would have had failover resilience into another building and all that sort of thing. You know, people didn't typically spend the money on that, and yet now they expect to have it. So it's quite interesting when you go into this world that, that, that they, they think that you've got to have those things, and they never did before. Um, what nav clients should be used on by the end users and how much bandwidth do you need? Those are usually the questions that we get asked when starting this process. Um, those are all the wonderful clients that you can have and we can help you with all of this stuff if you don't want to do it yourself. But we're going to talk to you today about how you can do it yourself as well. 
So, this one is a funny conversation because there's a difference between SQL Azure and SQL on Azure. <laughs> Microsoft, are, they're great at doing these things to make our lives uh, hard and hard. So, you can, buy, you can get a server, wind it up in Azure, and you can just install SQL Server on it, just like any other server. And you can say, I don't want to do that. I want to use this mythical thing. Do we call it Azure SQL rather than SQL Server? Yes, yeah. it's Azure SQL database. Yeah. So yeah. we use this thing, mythical thing called Azure SQL. What that means is you say you want a database, but you don't know where it is. It's not on this server. It's somewhere in the <coughs> ether, and it provides it to, to you as a service. Um, equally, you don't get access to play with that little thing. You can't index it. You can't, you know tweak it and think it's like it's a service you point your nav system at it and nav doesn't know much about it other than it's going to give it to that service to store some data in so there's a difference between those two options um, around performance which we're going to talk about but such is the world of azure that every week something new comes out and there's now a third option so yes. you can either have sql on your machine that you've just installed or in this azure sql or there is a preview version of um, Azure uh, SQL Manage instance, which is basically SQL Server managed by uh, Microsoft Azure. So they will manage the instance for you. It's fully compatible. It's 100% SQL Server. It's now on preview. It's not public preview. Uh, just some select partners. We are part of it. And it will be uh, generally available next year on Jan. So in a maybe two months time will be available. So you get the full 100% uh, SQL Server managed by Microsoft is highly available. You get pretty much the same option as uh, the SQL Azure. So you get the 35 days um, restore, uh, point in time restore, uh, but you get the full performance of normal SQL Server is on your virtual network in Azure. You can control any aspect of it. You can have um, SSRS reports running in there, your whole uh, ta tasks, uh, mail server, so you can do notifications so, from it. So it's right a middle ground between, you know, this is your, serv your SQL Server, you look after it, you do everything, versus the one which is absolutely sort of out of your control, it just stores data, and this thing is in the middle. It's not quite as in control as, as the one that's on your server, but it pretty much is, okay? So I think that's, I mean, I, we were talking before, we can't see any reason why we won't be using that. I mean, that's a, that's a exactly. really nice I, thing. Yeah, I think pretty much people won't, I don't see any situation where you want to use... Where you, have a, where exactly you install your own server with SQL on it. Why exactly, would, yeah. when that they, option is available. They'll patch it and they'll look after it and everything else. We do today, by the way, for all of our customers who we run and our own internal systems, we do use Azure SQL ourselves, okay? But there are some implications. So... Azure SQL, which you have to be on a version greater than 2016. So one of the reasons you might choose to do this new mechanism or have your own SQL Server installed is you're on a version older than 2016. Okay, that's, that's the first thing. If you are on 2016 or beyond, you can use Azure SQL databases. It gives you high availability at the box. You say I want a database, you automatically get all... You can restore to five minutes ago. You can restore to 30 days ago. It's, it's an, uh, literally by sliding under the slider bar. It's an amazing thing. Um, it it just does things like backup and indexing and all the things that you otherwise have to worry about as a as a SQL admin. So it just does all those things. You don't have to worry about it. There is no server to manage. It's it's just a service. Um, it's suitable for high throughput, small volume transactions, which is most of what NAV is. Mostly, you've got lots of little transactions. What we found was it doesn't work well. Is that a separate slide or should I put on here? So uh, it doesn't work well on a big tra uncommitted transaction. So we had a customer who was trying to import, I can't remember, 10,000 line journal, for example. Even more, and which is uh, in uh, the room. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> big journals, <laughs> weren't they? Yeah. Very big and journals. Yeah. A big journals, and on a regular basis. I think to start with, it was loading in the first place, but there was quite a regular need to do this, and it was just slow. And it was, you know, we, when we looked into it, we could post the same, we take the same journal, put it on our just a normal, even on a laptop, <laughs> on a SQL, woof, and it would absolutely shoot through. So it seems to be something in the mechanic of that communication between, uh, not just Nav, it's true of, of, of other applications, um, where having a big uncommitted transaction 
was very poor for performance. We don't think that will be the case on the new, um, the new version that will come out in, in January that Andre was just talking about. Um, interestingly, on this particular example, you could say, well, okay, that either means we have to put our, have our own SQL server, which I think is what we did in the end, was it? You're going to. The, the, there was an alternative, which is funny, because if you've got a huge general ledger journal, you don't actually have to post the whole thing, and if it fails, roll it all back. You just post it line by line. You know, Balance each line and post it line by line. And it was fine then. When we balanced it, the same journal, line by line, it posted in no time at all. So it was, it was an interesting, interesting thing to find out. So... Um, so it works with, so this is having your own SQL Server on an Azure machine. Then it's just like normal SQL Server. That works with any version of the databases. It supports great big transactions. Uh, it's, and, but you have to manage that yourself. So you have to look after the server yourself. So then you've got uh, the, the, if you're using a version after Classic, so the, uh, the 2013 and beyond, you've got application services, and those application services sit on a machine. And you could, if you wanted to, have a service sat on this machine here, a service sat on this machine here, and if this machine goes down, this one is around to get you back up and running. Okay, So you can do that in a couple of different ways. You can have it so it's load balanced, so different users are different using different servers, and this one goes down, all the users now go to this server. Um, and you can also have a sort of cold start environment where this server is always off, but you can bring it back up should this server go down. Okay? So it supports that whole high availability uh, principle as well. Um, so one of the other considerations, if you were looking at high availability, is do you need that high availability across regions? That might sound odd because... You know, if you if you were going to have one here, you'd probably have your or on prem, you'd have your server in your room, and maybe you'd have another one down the road somewhere. But would you think about putting it in another country? <laughs> so the reason why this becomes uh, um, apparent is, and we had a, ourselves an experience uh, last week, um, is servers don't tend to go down, but if you had a problem, you can have a problem in a region, right? A region of Azure could have a problem. Putting it in context, we've had this twice in three years. Okay, so if you compare that with your on-premise server, that's probably a lot better than your on-premise server is, right? But you know that 99.9% .9 availability does mean there is a possibility that you have some downtime. In I think both the situations we had, it was nothing to do with the servers. It was the networking in Azure. We couldn't get in to talk to our servers, and nor could anybody else in that was using that those servers in those regions. Okay, so it's this is not a you know, the thing will never be a problem. There, it's, it's software and hardware and bit like everybody else. But you can have geolocation replication. So you can have a set of servers over here, and the time you can get into this one here, it goes over here. And the chance that two regions are going down is highly, highly, highly unlikely. Okay? So again, when you look at that high, avail high availability, how high do you need that availability? And of course, there's a cost. You know, if you have, a, if you have servers here, and you have servers over there, they are literally twice, uh, twice the servers. Again, I think I'm right in saying, Andre, that you can fail over, those servers could be closed down in another region? Yeah, so I think in another region, you can geo-replicate the database that will cost you the same amount or a similar amount to what you have um, if you use Azure SQL um, on the uh, primary region. However, the machines now, the virtual machines, you can replicate those to another region at no additional cost. If they are now running, so as you will, you will pay for the traffic that it takes to like migrate and synchronize the changes that you do on one machine, um, but you don't pay for the physical. You don't pay for the machine as you will do for the ones that are started. You will only start to pay when uh, the machines will fail over to the other region and then they start and they start using resources on the other region. So that is a very good option. Not, not many of other clouds will do that. So. Uh, that that will that will that will simplify the the recovery time and it will uh, it will help with reducing the cost of that high availability. Again, but in that contest, we lost uh, was it an hour? Yes. So. Yeah. So um, last week we had well, um, we have a few customers on non central US and that was a region where they had at the periphery the network had some issues um, and. 
we couldn't get into the servers uh, for up to, uh, it was like about 50 minutes, so close to an hour. Um, and if we, um, if we opted that to half days, uh, we, that wouldn't be an issue. So we didn't have that situation. But it only happened twice in three years. We haven't considered it, but, uh, and the customers that we had, they were happy with the downtime. It was within the 99.95 SLA. So yeah, uh, it was an acceptable uh, downtime. Um, this is the point I made this morning, really. So Azure does support the web client, device clients, the Windows clients, and, and uh, uh, yeah, so it's tablet, mobiles, and so on. Um, so, but my view would be if you're moving this way, the web client is the right way to go. You know, where it, there are those of, are you still clinging on to the uh, Windows client or are you, are you web client? Yeah, yeah. I think there was, a, unfortunately, all of us in the industry had this sort of, at some point the web client will get, you know, will be as good. And, and, and we're trying to sort of, I, I think now it is absolutely, if, I think it's better. And therefore, it is a better way to go because there's a, of course, again, if you have a Windows client, especially if you had a, an old classic nav system, then you still need to have a terminal server. In Azure, you have a terminal server to access your nav system. So you still can access an old NAV system in Azure. You don't have to have a new one to put it into Azure. You just have to do the same things you would do today if you had on-premise service for accessing it. The Windows client, um, and, and again, where this is slightly different with, um, with on-prem versus Azure is there is a long way between you and where your servers are in Azure. So if we're in the US, there are, you know, there are regions all over the US. But if you're in California and your region happens to be, you know, on in the Midwest, there's a lot of time and space. So the Windows client makes a lot of difference because it's much faster. It uses it, it has a, a, a much uh, smaller latency. So the web client is definitely the way to go, especially if you have uh, a lot of distance between you and the, and the or zero service, and especially if you've got a failover resilience into a, another region in another country somewhere. But I would say I think that's almost irrelevant on the web client. I mean, the web client is 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 you know even from halfway around the world is, is, is very fast. So the actual steps, Mr. Andre. Yeah. So um, to get your nav in the cloud, uh, I think we are t talking here, probably the best way to get nav in the cloud will be to, um, to get your test environment in there and start using it um, as a UAT environment. Uh, we have a lot of customers that opt out to have the development environment in there, development and UAT. So they still have NAV on premise. They are testing with their UAT and development environment. They are happy w they, w they will go ahead with that. And uh, we do have a few customers on that situation. So the first step will be to sign up for a subscription. You get, uh, you get 30 days, um, I think it's 200 pounds credit something along that region uh, you can test with that to pop if you need more um, once you are in there create a windows server machine that will be your application server uh, the next step will be to export your sql database from on-premise to azure sql you do that through the uh, sql server management studio there are a few tools out there that will help you do that but that's the fastest way to do it you select the database you um, go to task export to azure sql database you sign in with your account and it will take a while until you get the database in the cloud and then it's there for you to use um, once you have it in there, you connect the database with the application server, you expose the click once client and the web client to your um, local users, and you start using the new, um, the new environment. That's the easiest way you can get your nav in the cloud and you can test it and uh, start using it. And as an example, uh, Chris here, uh, Woodward, I think that was maybe two months ago when we had, we had a few hours discussion. Uh, they were interested on the cloud. Um, we have maybe two hours or so discussions. What would be uh, the best options to get their system in the cloud? Um, well, we talked about um, what um, SQL to use um, exactly what, what we talked about today. Chris is a very 
uh, skilled technical IT guy. Uh, so he, he went off, he spent a day getting the servers, the application ready and so on. And then we had another two hours helping him uh, creating the click ones, getting the web client, connecting the database uh, with the application server. And they start using NAV on the cloud in probably a day, a day and a half with a few hours help from our side. Um, that was the test environment. Since then, uh, the live database is moved there. Not yet. January. Yes, it will be January yeah. when uh, when the go live uh, is going to be. As your SQL or um, as your SQL? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah and Chris mentioned exactly the same. So, posting journals is a bit slower, but there are other benefits. Yeah. Yeah. Big journal. Yeah. 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 And say so we could look at that post the journals by line by line, and it, it, that, that problem goes away. So, my yeah. point of view, we said we've taken the view that actually the disadvantage of having that time taken to post those large journals is offset against the benefits. Those are all good to Yeah. So, yeah. okay, we lose out on certain time for posting those large journals, but there's so many other benefits that. Yeah. yeah. And that could be fixed as well if, if, yeah, if the application scales. So, that is Security, it. Security sounds like your. Subject, my friend. Okay, security consideration. Um, most of the people, when they are looking at the cloud and providers, they are looking at compliance. Uh, GDPR is a big topic for next year and so on. So uh, Azure has the largest compliance uh, portfolio in the industry. There are a few examples in there. Um, it, it does include GDPR. However, Microsoft and the platform, um, they are certified for the, and they have those accreditations, and they are GDPR compliant. That doesn't necessarily mean that the environment that you built in there is going to be GDPR compliant. So you have that response. It is a joint responsibility. You need to make sure that environment you build, it is according to the GDPR rules. Yeah, so just by having the platform GDPR compliant doesn't make your whole environment being compliant. Yeah. Um, there are lots of tools out there that will help you. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. So they so they uh, they do their own in house, especially at the software level. They do their own penetration testing. They do it at the platform level. However, if you want to test, even though you have your own subscription, your own environment, your own VMs, you need to let Microsoft know that you're going to do penetration testing. Otherwise, you may get in trouble. So that is within your contract. So you can't do it without letting them know. Um, in terms of protection, they do protect. By default, you get DDoS protection on all the VMs and um, uh, websites that you have on Azure. So that is a big win from the on-premise where you have to worry about that yourself. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, they, they do allow you to do uh, pen testing. They do it themselves at the platform and software level. Uh, tools. There are lots of tools out there. And I think the most important one to point out is the Azure uh, Security Center. It is a hub where you can central, uh, centrally um, uh, centralize uh, the security policy. Um, you have things in there like just-in-time VM access, which I love uh, because the, you get, so let's take an on-premise example where you get um, the IT department will need to get into, let's say, um, your HR system to uh, help with an issue. They don't have that access by default. Even though there are administrators on the machines, they will need to log in into the portal. They will need to request the access, and then an administrator will approve that access, and they could decide at that time how long that access is. So you can give them access for two hours. After two hours, they can't get into that machine. And that helps a lot, because you don't know if the user that just logged in is the administrator that he says it is. Their credential may be compromised, and things like that. If they if there is a request and a process around that, you can prove that it is the right user. Yeah? Um, application whitelisting, that is another um, good one in there because with uh, all the VMs that you have and you enable the uh, Azure Security Center, you can whitelist the applications that you want to run on 
certain machines. So you can only say, you say, I want nav and jet and Excel to run on this machine, nothing else. You can install anything on those machines, they simply won't run. Mm. Um, OMS update. Um, so OMS, there is another, um, OMS combines the um, log analytics and the automation capabilities of Azure to help you understand um, how your machines comply in terms of updates and it, it will help you uh, apply the updates and schedule the updates to your machine. It does support Windows and Linux machines, so not only Windows, and it works on Azure and on-premise. So you can download the OMS uh, agent, install it on a premise machine, and you get the same view, the same way you can see on that screenshot in there. You have machines, and um, you have how many missed updates, how many uh, missed security updates, what are the critical ones, and you can uh, bundle the bundle of machines together and say, I want to update this machine tonight at 2, or I want to run the update every week at 2 a.m., let's say for this group and another group at 4 a.m. in the morning. And then we'll do the update for you. You can set up notifications and so on. So full automation on managing the update. Um, OMS also help you with uh, changes and tracking on inventory on files on the servers. Uh, that helps with GDPR as well as security. Uh, so with OMS, you have um, you can set up the agent to monitor certain uh, folders within those machines, as well as registry and services. And if there are any changes, you will get notifications like are displaying there. You can see who has changed any files, uh, even at the permission level. So if someone changes a permission to a file, you see all that history. It was like this. Now it's like this and this user ha uh, has made the change. Um, and now, if you need our help, uh, I think we're going to run through what Eamon was showing in the morning. What are the options? Yeah, this, this is, um, I don't think this is by any an exhaustive list, but it's a good indication of a, a way of understanding uh, the, the options. On the left there, you've got, You've got your own thing on your own tin in your own room. And obviously, that's all the what you're looking after. As you move on, you can then put then the next step is what Andre's been talking about, which is you get your own as your environment. You wind up some servers. They're still your servers. You still look after them. But Microsoft are managing the platform, so they're managing the computer room, if you like. You have no air conditioning or anything else. You simply have access to some cloud servers. But you still look after those servers, servers and you still manage the application. Um, then the middle one is really where, which we do a lot of our customers, where we take the uh, your system, we look after it in our Azure infrastructure. So Andre's responsible for it with his team to look after it, to look after the, the platform, which obviously still is looked after by Microsoft because it's, it's on Azure. But now our team are looking after the servers and the security and all those bits and pieces that go around it. And we look after the application, obviously, because it's, it's a now system anyway. So. That's where it's customer specific. That means if you want access to the SQL Server, you can do so. Uh, if if you want to have load balancing, you want a particular uh, um, uh, geo region uh, failover and all the rest of it, you can have whatever you like, and Andre will help configure that. Um, then we have move move into the multi tenant options, which are both us and the Microsoft uh, environments, where we're running a multi-tenanted system. So of course in that scenario you can't have access to the back-end database. Um, you, um, the, the servers in this case can actually be one of two things. There's, there's m many options, but one of the options is that the actual servers that we put your database in are managed by Microsoft. Okay, It's part of the D365 cloud. We get a part of their Azure thing and we can pop your database in there. We can do that or we can put it in ours. I, they're very interchangeable um, and in that scenario you obviously get a lot less choice over what happens we have a certain failover policy um, what you do in terms of modifications to the database is obviously severely limited once you get into that case you can only do things that are based on apps and on uh, extensions and then you get into the final one which is where it's actually in the Microsoft 
um, D365 environment totally, and then your options are even more limited. So then you've only got certain apps that they'll allow you to run. Um, but equally, it's all managed by Microsoft. So the, the grayness between these really comes down to what you need to do in terms of flexibility, how much control you want, how much flexibility you want in your system. You know, most people buy NAP because they want to do whatever they want to do with it. Every customer that's here today has got systems and functionality where they decided what functionality they wanted to put into it. Um, and the more you share your environment, the less you can do that. It's as simple as that. Okay? Um, but either way, they all get you into some cloud uh, um, option. The one on the far left and the second one are the two that really you're interested in if you've got an old classic system and you simply want to get rid of your servers and get your old NAS system in the cloud. Okay? Realistically, you're just using platform as a service. You're using Azure to give you some servers, but you're putting the same stuff on you've already got today. Okay? In that scenario, you'd equally need to have a terminal server so you can access that remotely into the cloud. Yeah, one thing to add, wh why would you want to use uh, a dedicated environment uh, or a specific customer specific environment is when you have third party tools that work with NAV that won't work in the SaaS world, like uh, for example, Anvil, uh, it needs access to the SQL database and that doesn't work on uh, Office 365 and, or in the multi-tenant version because you don't get access to the SQL database. So. Yeah, that's why you may want to choose the customer specific environment. If you have any other third party tools that you need on your business that work with NAV, which are not compatible with the SaaS offering. Most of our customers have got some form of integration. They've virtually all got kind of some kind of bespoke uh, elements to their system. So file sharing uh, integration is a sharing. very common one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. where you have um, download some files from an FTP server, um, process them locally on the server by a um, batch job or. Um, so this is sort of this is really where the sweet spot is. This is really somebody wants to sign up, just use it. They don't care what it is. It's just the financial system. Okay. Certainly, they're aiming that very much at the the Sage Line Fifty, the QuickBooks, that sort of market. The people that that actually don't care what it is, technology, they, they don't even know what an SSRS report is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Is that the last slide, Mr. That is the last slide. Well, this is the first presentation I'm anywhere near not overrunning. Brilliant.